perspective and gave me something more to think about. So thank you for that. Our next and final speaker is Jose. Jose R. Rosario is a speaker, author, and above all, an advocate. As a member of many diverse identity groups, Jose recognizes that common experiences bring people together and that taking stock of who we are gives us power. Jose wants to inspire others to acknowledge their identities, share their stories, and empower those who are underrepresented to rise. As a mental health professional, Jose understands that this empowerment and the creation of a space to be vulnerable can lead to individual and group growth, awakening agents for change. Jose is a clinical psychology PhD student at Clark University, studying the factors associated with collective trauma and healing within silenced communities. From this passion, Jose launched the Phoenix Empowered, an organization focused on mental health disparities in minoritized groups. In addition, he is an expressive arts facilitator through the Peace Love Studios. Welcome, Jose. Thank you so much, and thank you for the introduction, and also thank you, Sarah and Giselle, for sharing your stories. Um, stories are really what make the magic happen. It's how we can connect with one another in a real and vulnerable way. So today I'm going to be sharing my story with all of you, uh, and I am really excited to do that. I like to start at the very beginning. Uh, so I was a preemie baby, and I was born two pounds, one ounce. Uh, my exaggerative Puerto Rican grandmothers would tell you that I fit in the palm of their hand. Uh, I cannot verify that, so I'm going to have to leave it up to them to decide that. But that led to four months in the NICU, being poked and prodded. And my parents were young. They were young native Spanish speakers who didn't understand medical terminology and medical language. And the doctors, you know, really went to my parents and said, are you sure you can do this? This might be too much for you and no one is going to judge you if you give this child up for adoption. And my parents very quickly rejected that notion and said, you know, what's meant to be will be and this is our child. And I am very thankful for that because they've been a really amazing support, but also it's been a journey. And so we thought that after four months in the NICU that things would be better. And I was sent home and a week later, my mom was in the shower and she has given me permission to share this story since. And she heard a gasp on the baby monitor. And when she came into the nursery, I was blue in the face in my crib and I had stopped breathing. So my mom runs outside and my family says, we're going to figure this out. And we're, we're rushed to the hospital and come to find out I was not breathing for 11 minutes and 54 seconds, which led to some brain damage. So I have cerebral palsy. I use a wheelchair and two canes, but that is only one piece of my story. But for the formative years of my childhood, it was a big piece of my story. So I can't say that my peers treated me unfairly or treated me aggressively. In fact, I have a really fond memory of them trying to create a license plate for my wheelchair. And that was their way of trying to bond with me. Um, and looking back at it now, I can't help but smile because how awesome is it that you really wanted to connect in that way. But Unfortunately, my, my experience with bias and judgment came from people who had power over me. So when I was about six or seven years old, a doctor said to my parents, you need to give up the expectations that you have for this child. He's not going to meet the uh, dreams and goals that you have set for him. It's just not going to happen and you need to let it go. The twist of this story is that it was said right in front of me. So you can imagine being six or seven years old and hearing that you're not going to accomplish what your parents hope you'll accomplish or even what you hope you'll accomplish. And that devastated me. And it was at that point that I said, what is the point? Why should I continue with physical therapy? Why should I keep seeing doctors if there is no point to this, if nothing is going to change? And again, my parents were like, absolutely not. And you will never see that doctor again. Uh, and I am very grateful that that is the choice that they made. We found a new doctor. A couple of surgeries later, I was walking with two canes, going from almost being unable to crawl to walking. So this is all a really happy and inspirational piece of my story, but I want to remind you about the power of words. And the fact that somebody who was supposed to be my support system, who was supposed to push me and inspire me to move forward, was the reason I felt like I couldn't move forward as a child. And that to me is just unacceptable. 
So that newfound confidence in making progress in myself led me to jump into advocacy work. But of course, because life has many twists and turns, my advocacy work was also flawed. I never focused on my own story. I focused on the stories of other people. I focused on telling stories about risky behaviors, about substance use, with, and substance use in the youth community, and actually served as a consultant for the city of Providence at the age of 13, looking at youth risk behaviors, but never thinking about how my story impacted the work that I was doing. Although there were microaggressions, and there were times where people would say, I'm sure this kid doesn't know what he's doing. But there were also times after big events where I would get praised. And one particular time sticks out in my memory. I had just finished this really huge event and I was really proud of myself because it was the first time that I led something. And when they were thanking me, they said, thank you, Jose, because you got up and got dressed this morning. Now you can imagine my surprise that that's what they wanted to thank me for. That isn't my story. That isn't something that I want to be praised for. You got up and got dressed this morning. Why do I have to be praised for doing something that you also can do? And it to me felt like a slap in the face. But I was also really confused because I worked really hard and I thought for a minute that my disability wouldn't matter because in some ways I didn't allow it to matter to me. And I learned growing up and, and after that point going to college that that wasn't the case. And for a lot of us, college is a time of self-exploration. We figure out who we are, where we fit into the world, and I was really struggling to do that because my advocacy continued. I started with the disability awareness group on our campus, and we were doing some really great advocacy work around etiquette, around accessibility, around policy and procedure. But yet again, I wasn't focused on my identities, on how having a disability impacted my life, how being Latino impacted my life, all of my other identities impacted my life, but I never took stock of what that meant to me. I studied psychology and chemical dependency and addiction studies. I was meant to be an addictions counselor and I was doing addictions research in college. And there were many times where a lot of our samples, for example, were all white. And not once did anyone ever question that these samples were not representative of the experiences of my people, of people like me, and that the people in the classroom didn't look like me, and that experiences of my family were never even brought up in discussions of development, in discussions of identity and mood and all of the things in which we should be brought up in, because there are cultural boundaries, there are cultural differences, and we should celebrate those differences. And it was one day in my class of human diversity, and ironically, I smiled because human diversity was being taught by a white woman. And I remember feeling like, oh, here we go. She's gonna tell me about diversity. Let's see what she says about disability. And the way in which she spoke she started the class by sharing that we all hold privileged and minoritized or non-dominant identities and that they all matter and they all come together and intersect to create the person's experience. So it's okay to be privileged in some ways and minoritized in others. That's part of your experience. It's about how you use your privilege to really, really give rise to those minoritized identities. And that really struck a chord in me. I realized that my research and my work couldn't just be about data, but I didn't know how to do that because mental health professionals, we're not trained to not use data. We're trained to use data to, in order to make sense of the world. And it always percolated in the back of my head and I held on to it until my senior year in college. And I was very, I'm gonna say it, uptight. I wore a suit all the time, always had my data ready to go, and always made sure that everything I did was professional. No one knew anything about me. I never talked about having a disability outside of advocacy work. I never talked about how I felt. That just wasn't a conversation that I had in my family, in my profession, it wasn't what I did. And something changed one day. Someone approached me and said, we want you to do a talk. And I said, yeah, sure, you know, what data do you want? I'll do whatever you want me to do. What's the spin? What's the conference theme? How can I help? And they said, no, we don't want your data or a spin. We want you. And I stopped for a second and said, oh man, I already agreed to this. Now I have to do it. 
but what am I going to say? What is, what do they mean? They want me to talk about me. Who am I? Like, why does who I am matter? And I hate to say that that thought crossed my mind because we all matter. But, you know, going, going on with the talk, I did it because I knew I had to. And I remember being backstage and thinking, the exit's right there. I could just go right now. No one has to know. I can be gone. It's fine. I don't need to do this. I don't know how to do this. The night before, I had cried when I was trying to practice the talk. And I wasn't sure how I was going to do this without getting too emotional or becoming too unprofessional. And I stepped out on that stage and said, what's meant to be will be. They turned on my mic. And I have to tell you, the next eight minutes of my life are a blur. I didn't, I don't remember what I shared, but I remembered telling the story of having a disability and being in a classroom with supportive peers, but also being told you can't have a wheelchair and being forced to crawl. And one day a cat came into our classroom and sniffed me and everyone laughed at me because I couldn't have a wheelchair. And I talked about the moments that people thanked me for getting dressed. And when people asked me, what's wrong with you or what happened to you? Or the people who just didn't understand in my own family who said, maybe if you prayed hard enough or you worked hard enough, it'll be okay. And I even talked about dating because I don't know about all of you, but being a teenager is tough work. Now imagine dating with a disability and imagine dating being told, nobody's gonna wanna date you because you know it's a lot of work. And, and you have a wheelchair, that's a lot for someone to take on. Imagine what that does to someone's self-confidence. You see, people didn't realize that I was struggling with my self-esteem. For two years of my life, I wouldn't even look in a mirror because I didn't like what I saw. Between acne and glasses and the wheelchair and just feeling uncomfortable in my own skin because of the words of other people, I couldn't come to terms with the fact that I am me and that's beautiful. And I told this story and then I pivoted and talked about the mental health field and how we are doing a disservice because people like me are never on stages like that one or like this one. We're never here. Our stories aren't told. We don't talk about the close-knit family that might be like, why are you studying psychology? That's the devil's work. Or why are you studying psychology? Do you wanna work with crazy people? We don't understand those cultural differences the ways in which language doesn't transcend. And I told this story and people were nodding, but mostly they were crying. And I wondered, here we go, I'm the object of inspiration again. But what people were crying about was the fact that I told my story, the fact that I called everyone out, and the fact that I made it seem like this isn't okay anymore. And I walked off that stage and everyone was hugging me and I'm gonna be very honest with everyone here, I never thought I would tell my story again. In that moment, I thought, okay, I did it, that was good, but I have to get back to work. And I shook it off. But in the coming weeks after that talk, I couldn't shake the fact that something was different inside of me. Something had changed because I had shared who I was and realized that we needed to be better. So I went back to mental health work and I texted my friend who was in charge of that conference and said, I wanna do this again. So he got me set up to do a keynote at a university talking about what makes a good and inclusive advocate. And I said, sure, I'll do that. But I told my story and I talked about how things like active listening, things like respect really go a long way. And there was someone in the front row and they were crying throughout my entire talk. And I thought either I did something wrong or there's something deeper going on here. So after my talk, I, I put on my clinician hat and said, I'm just gonna check in and see how things are going. And I said, hey, how are you? And the person started crying and I went in for a hug even though we're trained not to hug. I went in for a hug because in that moment, it was two humans connecting, not a professional and someone else in the audience. It was two people who were being vulnerable together. And I hugged this person and asked why they were crying. And they said, well, you're the first person in over five years, in over 10 years even, to ask me how I'm doing. And it felt like a bucket of ice water. That is unacceptable. We should not be living in a world where people's first experience with talking about 
identities and diversity is, in, is at a conference where somebody is sharing their story and telling people how to be advocates. People's stories matter, words matter. And it was that moment that I decided this is going to be what I do for the rest of my life. I am going to tell my story, but not because I want to inspire. That's not my goal. I want to create a space where we remember that stories matter, that vulnerability matters, that talking about where systems have failed people matters, and to say that we can do better and we must be better, and that we have to create a, a space for people to tell these stories. Now, I've often heard that people rise from the ashes, but I have a hard time with that analogy because it makes one big assumption. It makes the assumption that everyone can rise. And yes, everyone can. However, when you're constantly told that you're incapable or that your story doesn't matter or you don't see yourself reflected, it really takes a space where you are told you matter to be empowered to rise. We need to empower each other to say, regardless of what these systems, these people, these experiences say, you need to tell your story. And so I wanted to make sure that every time I took the stage, it was to tell people that not only my story should be told, but the story of so many others. Right now where we are in this world, many stories aren't being told. And we're seeing a resurgence and a firm dedication to making sure stories are told. We need to be doing this work. I am Latino. I am a member of the queer community. I have a disability and I am so many other things. And I can only share my experience, but my experience matters. So meanwhile, while I'm giving talks, ironically, I was no longer an addictions counselor. I became a disability services professional and I was loving the work, being able to connect with students but also very frustrated with the system and always working to find a loophole. And I knew I wanted to go to grad school, but I was afraid because so many people had told me, I don't think you can do it, it's a lot of work. And they were right, it is a lot of work, but I could do it. And at first I thought I was going to study addiction, maybe disability in some way because that was my career. But then the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. And my students had a really strong reaction. And I realized that identity, really to its core, can connect us with people across the globe. If we feel this connection, this shared experience, we can also feel pain and hope and grief and happiness. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. That I wanted to understand how silenced and minoritized communities could collectively feel pain but also collectively heal and create more and more spaces, including in academia, for these conversations to happen. And so my students are really truly the reason my career is what it is today. Those students are the reason I share my story. They're the reason I take the stage and the reason that every day I make sure that I have a lens towards social justice. And on the days where I'm feeling tired because we all feel tired, I am reminded that my words matter and I am allowed to take a break, but then I get up and keep going because guess what? There's going to be another kid in a classroom that isn't allowed a wheelchair and I will not rest until that kid has every opportunity that they deserve. It's not about what you get. It's not about even deserving. It's about the human right to exist, to respect one another, and most importantly, to empower one another. So that being said, this is my story. And to wrap up, I wanna share that I am not perfect. I am not the perfect image of self-care. I am not necessarily characterizing myself as a disability advocate or a Latino advocate. I am characterizing myself as a human advocate, as someone who understands that every person's experience, including each of the panelists today, is different and that we will all work together to make the world a better place and we're going to continue to create spaces towards empowerment and with that i want to thank you not only for listening to my story and not only for being here with us but for choosing to be here because clearly this matters clearly it's important and it is 
for people like me, for people who aren't like me. Learning about identity, learning about experience matters, and we can all be better. So let's be better together. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for sharing everything. And thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their stories tonight.